So how many of you enjoyed learning social studies in school growing up? Yeah. <laughs> oh, quite a few, yeah. I mean, I was like in the middle. You know, it's not, it was not fun for me to remember all the kings and their time they ruled and where they conquered and the currencies and the capital of the countries. But then we had a new textbook, and it had this beautiful, glossy pictures, just like you would see in the National Geographic magazine. All those monuments, all those buildings, all those people, and their colorful culture, cuisine, and everything. I was really fascinated. So I t told myself that when I grow up, I'm going to travel around, and I have to sample everything. Like you heard from my introduction, for me, it's not enough just to hear about it, read about it. I have to do it by myself. So, so then. Growing up, then I realized like something else stuck me. You know, when you grow up, you have a job, you have to pay taxes and everything. Then I started thinking about it, like those civilizations, those cultures that flourished, that has to be really, you know, not only economic thing behind them, like the people or the citizens of those civilizations, they had enough, you know, opportunities to go get a job, pay taxes, but then they also have this mental capacity to be relaxed, to enjoy, and to kind of invent all these arts and literature and those monuments. So what kind of, you know, lifestyle they had that they, that, and what kind of, you know, society they had that allowed them to do all those things. And those monuments, those things, those old ages, people from the old civilization built, we still, are fascinated by that. When we go and visit them as tourists, we still cannot wrap our brains around that, that how could people in those days build such things that are still standing? So that's why we came about the aliens must have built it. <laughs> All right? So not those people, because how can this do? But one of the hallmark of such a flourished culture that can leave its legacy far in, into the future is like human beings. Any country or any culture, any civilization, it's foremost, uh, um, what say, rich is their human, human minds, the minds of their human beings or the civilized citizens. But one of the things these days we are facing, one of the problems, one of the adversity that us ourselves in this present time is facing is poverty. I had the privilege of volunteering as a AmeriCorps Vista for a few months. For those of you who don't know AmeriCorps Vista, it's a domestic version of Peace Corps. It was established during President Lyndon Johnson's time to, as an anti-war, uh, anti-poverty fighting machine. So it, the goal was to eradicate poverty, but as you all know, it's been like more than 50 years, we are still fighting poverty. We haven't gotten it out and it's like, these days when you read news and news, sometimes it can be very depressing with all the problems that comes. If you ask the federal government to define poverty, they'll say, okay, take a household with this many people, this much earning they are having. If they make it above that, they are not poor. If they're below it, they are poor. That's all, like income-based poverty thing. But poverty is a very complex issue. It's a much more complex issue. And during my VISTA orientation, we had an entire session to kind of like define what is poverty, what, what does poverty mean to you and me. And there were like a lot of young people, young students or kids in my group, and what they put forward was really very illuminating. Some of the things we talked about is like, you know, the not knowing where your next meal is gonna come from not knowing whether you'll get a hot meal or not, not knowing whether you'll be able to take a hot shower, not knowing whether you'll be able to have a place to sleep comfortably, warm, and so on. So uncertainty is one of the you know, defining things of poverty, not knowing the basic necessities of food and shelter and you know, those things you don't know whether it's gonna happen or not. Not in a month, not in a year, but the next meal, next you know, thing. And the other thing that also came up, which is, was very interesting, is that like unable to make your, not having the power to make your own choices. What do I mean by that? I, I wanna be a scientist, or I wanna be a doctor. I, that's my dream. I wanna live in a nice neighborhood. I wanna live in a house with a nice yard. How many of you think it's so easy to achieve? So it's when you work hard, when you dream, when you have goals, but you are not able to make those choices to move forward your dream because there are a lot of roadblocks, a lot of constraints that, are, that is being put 
put by the society which is not under your control. So that kind of leads to a lot of frustration. So these two things, given the uncertainty and feeling like powerless, frustrated with, to make your own life, to decide your, the path of your own life, can lead to a lot of stress and anxiety. So I'm not even talking about fear. Fear is like the first step everybody feels something, oh, what will happen if I get food? But that's for one time. But if you keep on prolonged, you know, it goes to stress and anxiety. Everybody feels stress. Everybody has like, you know, very um, stressful situations. Like for example, there will be like two minutes for every good speaker when you step on the stage, look at the audience, and t start talking because I have to see whether you're really connecting with me or you're going to be like, you know, okay, let me check my Facebook status. <laughs> All right? That's stress. But then once I realize, ah, oh, I, I got them hooked up, so then my stress level will go off. And that's like a very good stress. It's okay. But there are also other situations where stress is very good. You see a tiger, you have to, and then your heart rate will go up, the blood pressure will pump, up, then your brain will say, run, and then you run. That's very good for you, that kind of stress. It's really, really good for you, all right? Unless you, you are a very wonderful person, you want to feed a tiger, that's different, okay? <laughs> so, but then, body has different stress mechanisms, but there's also another stress where you produce cortisol, so you, adrenaline rush stress is fine, but then there's also tolerable stress. You have stress, and then you can, like, you know, you, you f see it's very difficult, but after some time, your, your brain kind of adjusts, everything will normal, and you say, oh, I learned the lesson from that situation, I can go ahead and, you know, build my life, that's fine. But there is very toxic stress, like you have to prolong, you have to live, like in poverty, living with such an uncertainty, uncertainty over a long time of periods of life, where you have to really like, you know, you don't know, this is stress, you know, you have to pay your telephone bill, you have to get, you have to pay your rent, you get your eviction notice, your kids are, you know, if you're a single mother, then your, your kids are there, you have to, so many things that we have like as a society, as a person of the society that you have to do and that kind of like this poverty, prolonged poverty and all the stresses that comes with that that really can keep your stress levels. It doesn't give you a, your body and your brain to come down to the baseline and get to normal. So that really affects your body, immune system and then also your brain. Added to this stress and anxiety, there's another very important uh, component to this poverty and the stress related to that is your societal and peer bias. We all have implicit bias, okay? We all have implicit bias, but then there's this bias against poor people. We all think that if I made it, why can't they make it? If they had worked hard, if they had studied good, they could have made it. So, And we are in a society where we define productivity. We love productive people. Everywhere we want productive people. And we define that productivity as the title of the job. Oh, he's so and so. The amount of you know, well-placed people that they know, the money they have, that's all we look as productivity. And as long as that, you have to all be honest and think about in your back self. If there is somebody else who is an executive E or CEO of a company and there is a poor person who won't have give you anything back, we will ignore them because that the CEO is the person you want to say hi to, you want to be connected to because he has the position to kind of like, you know, push you up in life. So poor people are re literally made invisible in our society because they are labeled as not productive, they are not, you know, they are not useful anymore. So that's the way we are working as a so society and hopefully I will take you through that, but that, that peer by us, peer means we are all human beings, you and I are peer, it doesn't matter what you are, like, you know, whether you are a doctor or a lawyer or, or you know, high school or anything, we are all peers as, as of the label that we are all human beings. And when each of us are looking at us with bias and treating us literally as invisible, that in turn feeds back to the anxiety and the stress those poor people feel. So as you can imagine then, that never lets their stress level come down. They're always stressed, you know, to be uh, felt invisible. So when we look at the brain, so this is the cortex, the outer layer in this bright, beautiful yellow is the cortex of the human brain. As you all know that this is, this is what, the cortex is what makes us human being, you know, like all our wonderful higher level of thinking and uh, intelligence and everything. You have the frontal lobes, which kind of like makes you decision, it, it's involved in decision making and you know, reasoning and higher creative thinking and so on. And within that 
Uh, below the cortex is the, this blue region, anterior blue region, is, is called the limbic system. It's where emotions are processed. All our emotion and then learning and memory formation are made. As you can see, the way this brain is organized, like this is your hippocampus, that's where the learning and memory happens, and then this is your amygdala, that's where your, all your emotions are processed. All of your sensory input, like your touch, the vision, the uh, uh, hearing everything is goes straight to here and then it's all processed along with the cortex to make sense of it and that's how we form our consciousness of us and others so as you can see all this um, emotional stuff uh, this is what makes us human like every all the emotions we process it and then it's connected feedback to, to your cortex and when when you are having too much stress, this is the structures that are gonna get affected. And your hippocampus, where the learning and memory is happening, and is the amygdala where the emotions are there, it's always associated. So brain does a lot of associative learning. So when you have a incident that involves a very bad negative emotion, and then that gets imprinted, imprinted into the hippocampus, where it's been like, okay, this situation or this person is bad, he made you feel like this. So that kind of like association happens. And when, when we talk about stress, the chronic stress, it leads to a lot of changes. So when you, the first thing would be like your um, hypothalamus, which kind of like over, oversees all the hormonal systems, for example, for the simplified thing. It's the one that kind of regulates the cortisol, the hormone, one of the hormones that is released during stress, okay? So when you have prolonged cortisol, then what happens is that a lot of changes happen physiological, like, you know, uh, changes to the brain, architecture of the brain itself. What they have found in studies is that the layer of the cortex itself gets thinned up. If you grow up, you are, you know, very poor, you're growing up in poor parents and everything. So it gets uh, thinned down. And that also there's a lot of changes in the receptors that are, that are binding to the cortisol and then in turn it can regulate. So all the time we are like, our brain shapes itself from the experience, which it's not like it was very, Years ago, we thought brain is uh, grows till you are, you know, teenage or something. After that, it doesn't change. No, that's absolutely wrong. Our brain is always continuously changing itself, adapting itself to the experiences that we are facing. And also, what happens is that, like, when um, prolonged stress also changes uh, the expression of a protein called myelin. If you look at the axon, there is a my sheet. Myelin is a protein that forms a sheet that wraps around the neuron so it can efficiently, it's an electrical wire, transmission of electricity. So when myelin is the insulation, so you get very fast and you know, um, efficient communication through the neurons. So if you look at the teen brains, when we say teenagers are not able to make proper decisions, are not very good in impulse control, that's because their myelin is not yet fully formed and the Cortex, the frontal cortex is not completely myelinated. And in people that are going undergoing prolonged stress, this also will be like that. Their brain will be like the teenage brain level. So it's not totally myelinated. It's not very efficient. That means the frontal lobe functions are not going to be very good. So those functions, we call it as like executive functions. It's not like the executive function of a CEO of a company. The brain does a lot of executive functions. One of that will be impulse control. For example, you want to cross the road, you see it's red for you, but there's a car coming there, but then you think uh, that car does, doesn't look so fast, let me go. You know, said, but then your brain, other brain, part of the brain will say, mm, you know, he might be coming fast, you don't know, can you just wait, it's going to be one or two seconds, but then you cannot control the impulse. How many of you then said, oh, I can make it and dart through the road and crossed it? If, if not many people, that's good, but I have done that. And then I'm like, why did you do that? What did you save? So that kind of like, a, that's a very simplified example of impulse control. But you can imagine, so then other one is working memory. Working memory is the ability of the brain to kind of like, you know, get the piece of information at that time and make, process it and make decisions based on that. So that's very important for us as a human beings to work, to make decisions, to switch tasks, to say this is good, this is not right, and so on. 
So all those executive functions and which can result in your behavior is being affected by this prolonged stress and the subsequent changes in the architecture of the brain itself. And this is what in, happens in you know, people who are in, living in adverse conditions. Because when you think about adverse poor conditions, they are living in a neighborhood that's polluted. They are living in a neighborhood that's full of violence. Nobody knows whether they will, when they walk on the street, they will make it alive or not. You know, the, the children in those poor neighborhoods won't have a very quality one-on-one -on -one time with their parents because if I was preparing for the talk and then I have to be like, wait, I have to focus. Think about that like if you are living every day not knowing how to make the, you know, put foot on the table. You are not going to look at your child and say, oh my God, wonderful, you dropped that. No. So that that's like a very vicious cycle. We all are believed to, oh, if you work hard, you get a job, you can get out of poverty. No, poverty is a much more complex thing and it really affects all the executive functions. The normal person who has a normal stress level, normal healthy brain that can process this won't be behaving differently than a person whose executive functions are affected. That's why in a unrelated thing, a lot of the happenings that happens, like you know, in the news when we say, why did that person did not raise his hand, but no. That his brain is not like the way your brain is working. It's totally changed. So it, that's, that's what happens in a, in a brain like that. So there's um, epigenetics is an evolving field in biology, which has like, you know, which has a lot of implications everywhere. One, how many of you know what epigenetics is? If, Okay, so it's, um, it's where the environmental influences change the organism, but it, your DNA is not changed. Your DNA is essentially, the genetic material is not changed, but there are like tags and a lot of things that go and change the way that the DNA is expressed. So you can easily change the phenotype of an organism. So that happens in a lifetime. So with all the environmental cues that we are getting, we, our brain, like our DNA is being modified. Either the gene is expressed or not expressed, so that's called epigenetics. Yep. And there is also another field, evolving field, called transgenerational inheritance, and that is how these epigenetic modifications not only affect one generation, that it's not going to affect you, but it can affect you way generations in the future. There are studies which show that even in the fourth generation, the set, the, the subjects are sensitive to the stressors. So that is also we are learning. So when you talk about poverty, it's not just one person. It can go into other, you know, it can be carried over. So if you talk about Holocaust and then you're wondering why Jews are getting upset that to, of the protest because they ha can get their triggers even though they haven't been, you know, prosecuted. If you think about African American slaves that who, why they are getting so stressed, they are not slaves now here, no they can still get the triggers from their past generations. That is ingrained in our way our biology works. It's not them, it's the biology of being a human. So that's just a picture of that, but I showed you. So I made you all gloomy and sad. All these terrible things are happening. But is it the end? No. Our brain is a wonderful organism. I already, sorry, organ. So I already told you that it keeps changing. It has this amazing ability to change itself, modify itself, come back. It's called brain plasticity. Many people call it as neuroplasticity. People are also call it as synaptic plasticity. It's the ability of the brain to really like learn from experience and then change it. So all we need to is give, give a chance. Okay, so I want you to do a small exercise with me. I just want you to turn to the person next to you and say just hi. Just hi and just turn back. Okay, okay. How did it feel? Like silly or okay or normal? Because we all do, all right? Whenever we go anywhere, we say hi, hi, hi. But now I want you to turn back to the same person, look into their eyes, and then think about who is this person? What is the path that he walked? Why is he here? What is his dreams or aspirations like that? I want you to look into the eyes and then think about all these things and then say hi. Take 10 seconds. Did it feel any different when you said that hi? Yeah, let me tell you, when I came to U.S. in 2010, I'm going to run over the time, so. Um, when I came in, to U.S. in 2010, I, I was 
doing a postdoc at the Albert Einstein, and I was walking, there was a person said, hi, how are you doing? I was like, oh, somebody is asking, it's a very personal question for me. If somebody asked me, how are you doing, you know? It was a very personal question, and I thought, oh my God, my life is gonna be better, I'm gonna make friends in the US, everything is gonna be good, and I'm like, thank you, because I was in Germany before there, you have to always first thank you, and then, then answer the question. So I said, thank you, I'm doing fine, but the person was already at the end of the corridor. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like standing there and thinking like, you asked me a very personal question about me, how I am feeling, and you don't even wait for the answer. What that shows that you really don't care about how am I feeling? And then I realized like everywhere you go in US, everywhere people are asking, how are you doing? And then they go on. Like I'm like sometimes if I'm in a very in my crazy mood, I will just like, yeah, I'm doing fine. How are you doing? And then I keep trying to give the conversation with them. There will be like few percentage that will be like, oh God, why did I ask this person? <laughs> and then there will be some who will be very want to be polite. They say, oh, I'm good. And then they will be like afterwards they will try to ignore you. Only very few person will then really like you know take on the conversation with you on a personal level, and that is the problem. Like when I talked about the societal you know, peer bias, we, we literally are treating each other invisible. But our brain is not made to be like that. There's the entire set of neurons called mirror neurons that is there to not only to imitate at each other, to look at your face and see whether you're sad or happy. There is a region of cortex called the insular cortex that is there to feel the pain of others. Empathy originates there. If you feel pain, I look at you and I feel the pain. That is the way brain is made. We are all made, we are all social animals. I remember reading it when I, when I was in my school, but that is true because, not because we tell that, because of our brain. It, it has so many uh, things in place, all the neural network and connections and regions that to show that we are all connected. So I want you to ponder with me this, this saying from Sridi Sai Baba, who's, who's considered as the, one of the greatest 19th century fakirs of India. And from what we know about brain, I, want, I cannot help but admire that. Unless there is some relationship or connection, nobody goes anywhere. If any men or creatures come to you, do not discourteously drive them away, but receive them well and treat them with due respect. Doesn't matter whether you give money or anything. Charity for the sake of charity is, is, is of no use. But to treat them as, you know, as yourself, as an extension of yourself, with give them respect. Show them that, yes, you recognize them as your fellow he human being. That is the connection we need to go somewhere. Otherwise, we will never reach anywhere. One last thing. This is close to the home. The, this is supposed to be from Martin Luther King uh, Jr. as recalled by Larry Brilliant. It says that the, moral uni the arc of the moral universe you know, would bend towards justice, but it would not bend on its own. We all have to do our part. We have to jump up, we have to tug it, twist it to reach to the justice. And poverty is one of the greatest injustice of our society, and we all can do that, and we all have the know how and wherewithal to do that. We have our brain. All we have to do is that when we look at the human being next time, individual next time, we have to look at them as, you know, acknowledge them for who they are. And with that, we can really make a great change. And that is the world that I want to create, I want to live in, and I want to also leave it for my children and the next generation. Thank you very much. <laughs>